Folks, welcome to the first ever episode of the Cohesive Chemistry podcast. In this podcast, I'm hoping to talk to some of the big names in the IB chemistry world to gain some insight into their expertise and experience. My ultimate goal here is to, to take what I learn and hopefully become a, a slightly better teacher myself. This week, I'm joined by James Midgley, aka Mr. M4 Chem. James currently works as the head of student well-being at the Australian International School in Singapore and has taught IB chemistry for about 15 years. He's become somewhat of an internal assessment guru through his experience as an IA moderator, admin of an IB chemistry Facebook group with close to 3,000 members and the creator of many a YouTube video breaking down the IA process. So James, welcome to the podcast and, and thanks very much for your time. Good afternoon, Ollie. Thanks very much for having me. Very grateful to be here. So I thought maybe we'd start off with uh, you giving us a bit of your, your background and, and how you kind of came to, to teaching IB chemistry. Okay, a quick candid history would be I didn't originally set out to be a teacher. I did my degree at the uh, sunny halls of the University of Hull way back in the mid 1990s, which is a long time ago now. Um, I did chemistry with drug design and immediately went into working at the pharmaceutical industry in Hull, which is my hometown in Yorkshire, UK, if you don't know where that is. I worked for a company called Reckitt and Coleman, became Reckitt Benkiza, looking after brands or working with brands like Lemsip, Disprin, Dettol, Gaviscon, Fibergel, big name brands in the healthcare market. I started as an analyst in the laboratory because I had some chemistry skills, obviously. I became the lab manager. And then I moved over to production management and I was managing the production of uh, Dettol on a 24 hour shift basis. I then moved to Nottingham, uh, Boots Contract Manufacturing in the sunny halls of uh, the middle of England in Nottingham, uh, where Robin Hood and Maid Marion lived, um, looking after the production of Neurofen, which is Advil in the States, another blockbuster brand. Um, I lasted about six years doing this and I was the production manager for Neurofen, looking after the tableting, printing, formulation, uh, problem solving, uh, production line diagnostics, all these things. Realized I was one of six middle managers waiting for the senior managers to die until we got a one in six chance of being promoted to become that next person. Um, in your early thirties, you get epiphanies. One of the epiphanies was there must be more to life than this. So I looked around and I could have converted my chemistry degree to uh, a law degree, done an LPC, or I could have gone and done a PGCE and you guessed it. I went and did the PGCE. So I went to Leeds University, did a one year PGCE, did my teacher training in a sunny town called Pontefract, uh, where they make Haribo sweets, which I'm sure everyone has heard of. And I did, I never looked back. I never missed working in industry, although it's helped me. And I just really loved the, the act of teaching. Um, I worked two years in Nottingham. I then went to Japan. I was at Yokohama International School for four years as an IB chemistry teacher. That's where my IB journey began. A uh, quick, steep learning curve, maybe more of that, that shortly. I then moved to be head of chemistry at the Uplands International School in Penang, Malaysia. Um, I then moved back to the West for a little while. I went to the Guernsey Grammar School and I was IB coordinator and head of chemistry there. And then I moved over to back to uh, East Asia and came back to uh, Singapore. Um, now, seven years ago as a head of year 12. And for the last two years, I've been the head of student well-being, whilst also teaching uh, 11 and 12 uh, chemistry. Um, I started moderating probably about 80 years ago. Um, and I must say my hit rate is about 75 to 80%. Some years I don't pass the qualification. Um, I need to realign myself with the, the target. So perhaps that's good for people to hear that, you know, I, I love the fact you said I was a guru of IA. I don't think of myself in, in that way. I certainly don't pass the selection every year. Um, but, you know, seven or eight times out of 10, I do pass. And I think I still have uh, a lot to offer in terms of uh, newness and fresh ideas. Yeah. So that's my candid history. Hopefully I didn't get my full life story there, Ollie. And there was uh, some kernels of uh, interest in that little uh, guided tour. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, particularly in my in my, in my vision of you, you are an IA guru, given, given your experience. And it's, it's interesting to hear your kind of your wealth of experience from actually working in industry which probably would it be fair to say has played into uh, maybe more comfort than a lot of teachers experience with that ia process and and getting hands-on in the lab oh absolutely we had um we were very well resourced it was the industrial laboratory when i was lab managing 
and we had XRF and we had Carl Fisher apparatus and auto titrators, uh, uh, near infrared spectrophotometers, uh, HPLC GC was the main workhorse of the laboratory. So when you go into a school lab, certainly, you know, we're pretty well resourced, we're, we're pretty well off, but we certainly wouldn't have like a HPLC uh, sat in the corner, which is, I don't know, 100,000, 150,000 US a pop to analyze the quantification of organic compounds. But then I can talk about that in the classroom. And we do have sort of mini GC, mini UV, mini uh, spectrophotometers, and they sort of lead into those more expensive, more uh, sophisticated things. But I can talk about that with, with confidence. We used to use this to analyze the amount of uh, aspirin in a disprint tablet or the amount of paracetamol in a Lemsip pack a sachet, but for instance. So I think it does um, augment what I do and what I can offer in the classroom. And so I can give real life examples just at the drop of a hat for, for most organic chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. The other thing you mentioned uh, a moment ago that I wasn't aware of is that there's kind of almost like a test to become an IA moderator. You're, I assume, moderating work uh, to a certain standard. And then if you pass that, then you're accepted as a moderator. Is that is that how it works? Ah, uh, interesting. So if you apply to be a moderator and you are lucky enough to be accepted you then go through a training module, which is actually very good, uh, respect due to the IB for, for making that. You then get five practice scripts, which when you press submit, you get feedback on, and it will tell you if you are within tolerance. So if you bang on plus or minus one or plus or minus two, if you're plus or minus three overall with the principal examiner, that's it. That's a fail. You failed your, your uh, practice sample. But that's no biggie. You should be tuning in on your practice five. You then do a qualification five. So you've done 10 before you even begin moderating. If your qualification five are all with intolerance, it will allow you to go on. I would say more than half of moderators, again, fail that first practice qualification. Mm. And then if you're not too far out, then the system will give you another five to qualify. So you will have marked fully 15 full IAs with the, there's no payment for that. That is just you proving that you know what you're doing yeah. before you're allowed to continue. You can be allowed to continue and depending on how you've done, if you get them, all of them absolutely bang on with what the principal examiner has decided that they are, then your sampling rate will be one in 10 IAs will be a seed going forward. This is a quality assurance, but let's say if you've not been absolutely within tolerance, you're just slightly outside, the seeding rates might be one in five and therefore you, every one in five, you're not paid for it. That is just a seed and you have to pass that seed to continue marking and to continue moderating within the uh, system that the IB uses. So it's a very strict, very uh, nailed down for, for very good purposes. This is 20% of the mark, as we all know, this is a two grade difference. This is this turns a four into a six if they get full marks and if they get it right. So this is critical that everyone is judged the same. And the system, I believe, is a high quality system to make sure that happens. Right, yeah. So I know the the IB or the kind of the internal assessment gets slammed a little bit by teachers. It feels sometimes like a bit of a lottery, but there is actually there is actually quite a lot going on to try and make a an inherently subjective thing as objective as possible. It's not it's not just a lucky dip as to how you're moderated. I think that the my uh, conjecture to that is it is quite easy to, to to kick the dog in the corner, which is the IA. Yes, okay. Um, however, I've been a moderator for a number of years and I was a team leader for a couple of years and seeing at the beginning of the session, I might start with 20 moderators in my team. By the time I get probably a month in a third of those have already been kicked out because they're not hitting that right. principal examiner mark. And it, it is unforgiving. It is really unforgiving. And it's, it's a big slap in the face when it happened. It's happened to me. It happens to everybody. Um, it's just like, no, you are, there's an X on the screen. You can't do not proceed. Do not collect, do not pass go, do not collect $200 sort of thing. You know, it's right. uh, it's a harsh process, but for very good reasons. And there is variation within that, but I would always say, what is the alternative? What do you suggest we do? Because I think what differentiates the IB from say the A-level or the HSC or the AP is that 20% coursework. And some kids really thrive on that and they really get so much out of that. And I think that's one of the best things the IB does in terms of preparation going on to university courses. And when I speak to our alumni that have come back and said, wow, you know, I knew how to do this. I knew how to propagate my uncertainties. I knew how to do my, my graph errors and all these things. I was way ahead of those other kids that came from a different system. So I think the IB could do a better job of selling what this actually benefits it gives them. And mm -hmm. it gives some really good hardcore skills. And yes, it's not perfect. 
I'm not claiming it's perfect. There are things which go through which ought not to and things which are not picked up. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is which is always going to be the case to some extent. Um, yeah. Okay, before before we dive into some, some of the nitty gritty of the internal assessment, which I think is certainly one of your areas of expertise that has a lot of value to, to give to other teachers, particularly new and inexperienced teachers. I wonder if you could give me a sense, like a big picture sense of, of how your classroom teaching has changed over your, your kind of 15 years uh, in the IB chemistry program. Sure. When I, when I first landed in Yokohama, Japan, with my suitcase from Heathrow Airport into Tokyo, um, I, I jumped off the plane with, with my rucksack on my back and kind of went into an unknown world. Um, I was the only IB chemistry teacher, it turned out. I didn't know this. There was no other IB chemistry teachers on site. It was a beautiful school, absolutely gorgeous. But basically, James, this is you. This is, this is up to you. You need to make this work and make this happen. Okay, I've done a bit of A-level teaching, but I was still pretty fresh out the box. I was still a green teacher, despite my age and my industrial experience. That didn't tell me how to teach the ideal gas equation, or it didn't tell me how to do the Arrhenius plot, or, you know, acids and bases and all things like that. It didn't tell me how to do so That was a massive, steep learning curve. Um, I worked hard on that, as all new teachers do. I really feel sympathy with all new teachers coming into IB chemistry. It's a, it's a tough, exponential learning curve as you begin. Mm. And of course, I inherited some IAs from the previous teacher. At that time, you could do a part of an IA. You could send, you could start the design from this bit and the investigation from that bit. And the, it was it was a dog's dinner. It was an absolute dog's dinner. And I will say my uh, biggest frustration quickly became the internal assessment. And that became my focus. Again, uh, I left Japan feeling pretty confident. Within After four years, I kind of got my grades within moderation. They come back not altered by more than two or three. I felt but at the beginning, they were all over the place. And that really frustrated me. I'm sure everybody's the same. You don't want to let your kids down, right? You, the, mm. the, those kids are there. You are responsible for their success. And if you've not done everything you can, that, that's a, that, you can't sleep at night if that, that doesn't happen. So I worked hard to make that work. Went to Uplands. Um, that was all good. Went to Guernsey. And at the time, the, the YouTube thing, the, the tech thing wasn't really happening. We had these things called blogs, and I think blogs still <laughs> exist. And I created a little chemistry blog, and there was the odd little video on there. And that's perhaps like the kernel, if you like. That was the seed that, that came to build the tree a bit, a bit later on. Um, what happened then was um, I was teaching A-level and IB in tandem, and the A-level certainly enhanced my IB teaching more than anything had ever done before. Particularly, mm. the, the IB does a narrow slice of organic chemistry. The A-level does a huge slice of organic chemistry, for instance. So the context that that brought in has certainly enhanced my teaching. That's one of the big enhancers in that career progression that I've gone through, teaching A-level and IB at the same time. And looking at their practical model, the assessed practicals versus the open-ended um, students can decide what they want to do IB, which I'm a huge fan of. I know that people, depending on their perspective, will go for one route or the other. That's okay. That's fine. As I came to Singapore, um, Singapore is quite a unique context. Well, not unique. It's quite a um, distinct context, perhaps is a better word. The parent expectations are very, very high. Uh, the uh, academic expectations are very, very high. And certainly the, the things that change my teaching were parent complaints. Parents do complain in, in many jurisdictions on the planet. And a parent complained that Mr. Midgley, my work name, was not making videos like the maths teacher. The maths teacher was doing worked solutions of past paper questions. And I was a terrible teacher because I was not doing that for their son or daughter. I can't remember what it was, doesn't matter. So under great pressure from the principal of the school, I was forced to make a video solving a past paper. And I think it got, I think it got 10 views in a month. And I think they were all my wife. Okay. I was going to say, <laughs> nobody, does that count as viral was, at that time? Not that quite, just, I don't think. <laughs> so the wife was going, yes, James, yes, yes, I'll press that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I did that. I did a couple more. Then I did it topic by topic. And I did this for about uh, nine months, maybe a year. So there's uh, videos on how to solve kinetics and equilibria and organic and da 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 da. And then I, I got in touch with Richard Thornley, or Richard Thornley got in touch with me and said, James, what you're actually doing, you're breaking copyright. You can't put the uh, IB question papers on. And he knew a, a lady who'd done an IB biology videos exactly the same. The IB had got the plug pulled on yeah. the YouTube channel. 
So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm at a thousand views now. I'm not going to let these 1,000 views go. So I can't, I can't. And, but I did. I pulled the plug, pulled the plug. And um, I just remembered that the most difficult thing that I'd done was the IA. So I did, a, I think it was the Awesome Ideas for IB Chemistry, which is one of the early first videos. Um, then there was one on uncertainties. And then, of course, COVID hit. So COVID hit. And everyone was struggling and everyone didn't know what to do. And that's when um, I got in touch with uh, John Chewy up at UWC uh, Hong Kong. And he's taught me so much about using uh, molecular modeling, uh, databases, spreadsheets, uh, simulations, um, just the Chem Collective, Chem React, WebMo, uh, Chem Compute, all these things that you don't need to be in a laboratory for. And while the A-level really ratcheted up my, my chemistry ability to teach and my knowledge, the stuff that we got, which was secondary data, internal assessment, has just been absolutely uh, just stratospheric in terms of where my um, focus is in the classroom right now. And that's enhanced all of my teaching. So I can go on to WebMo, I can build a molecule, I can do the hybridizations, I can do the bond angles, I can do the relative energies, I can do the electronegativities, I can hit SDBS and pick up the IR spectra, the NMR spectra straight away, and it's just boom, it's at my fingertips like that. And even one of the early things I saw was the University of Rollo, which was a iodine clock online or iodine clock. You could change the temperature, you could change the concentrations. I think it's five or six different measurements. Every uh, run gave a different result. So you got your uncertainty. I was like, wow, we don't even need to be in. We couldn't be in the laboratory because of COVID. We're not allowed to go in. But all these kids, I can say, right, you can do this. Just run this. You can generate different data, unique data for every kid. And you can do temperature, you can do concentration. None of this home kitchen nonsense, which I didn't agree with from the IB, but that's a separate story. But you can do real hardcore good chemistry, get an Arrhenius plot off of there, LNK, 1 over T, activation energy, bump, you've got a high scoring IA. And the online simulations, the Chem Collective is fantastic. Chem Reacts has just blown me out of the water. That's, that's so good. All these done properly in line with the criteria. You never need to open a burette or buy another uh, pipette or flask Winchester of hydrochloric acid ever again. It's all online. So in terms of what's changed, I've gone from a beginner, novice, uh, yeah. had to learn very quickly. Um, the environment has changed for everyone. The circumstances changed. Everyone, everyone's circumstances changed. I've reacted to that. And I've always seeked to do the new thing, whether it's blogs or it's, it's, it's a YouTube video or it's using uh, simulations or it's linking with, you know, the real gurus, if you like, of the IB chemistry world. You know, Jeff News has put my videos onto, onto in thinking, which was, I remember seeing, oh my gosh, I, I look, you can see who's like look, clicking. This, this is in thinking. And my video is on in thinking. This is like Jeff News is like, he is like the Pope of IB chemistry. And <laughs> he put my video. <laughs> and I think there's like a dozen of my videos on that channel now. And when I look at where it's been pumped out, as teachers are linking it and putting it on their uh, lesson plans and they're putting it on their, their, their um, websites. And it, it's just it's just really snowballed. So I've done, I think, everything that I can do at the moment for the legacy syllabus in terms of internal assessment. I'm in a bit mm. of a holding pattern at the moment. I'm looking what's going to happen with this first iteration of the new syllabus. I know it's not a massive change. It's a nuance. It's not a huge change. It's not, it's not a seismic shift. It's just removing the personal engagement communication, making it half conclusion evaluation, half investigation. Um, I'm pretty confident that I could already do that, but let's just see what happens in the first uh, iteration and the first examiner's report and what we get in. And then I'll start making videos for the new syllabus on internal assessments. Yeah, it, it, really interesting. I think you, you mentioned, I, I have a kind of sm small fish YouTube channel, but actually the, the act of making videos I found quite valuable for my teaching in the classroom, having to think through when you're kind of planning a video, it really forces you to engage with, okay, what, what are the steps I need to move through here and how am I going to articulate those to really clearly explain what I'm trying to do? And it sounds like you em embracing those videos kind of, as you mentioned, snowballed into other opportunities. And it's maybe a, it's, it's an interesting point particularly for new and experienced teachers who are interested in kind of broadening their scope of, of stuff they do. I, a few people reached out to me after I co-authored the, the, the new Pearson textbook and said, how, how did you end yep. up getting there? And actually, I think sure. you, you're a good example of 
just try and embrace things that interest you, whether that's technology, explanations, IA. Uh, you're talking a lot about like kind of database IAs and, and simulations that yep. you can use. Taking those opportunities off, often ends up kind of building into something that you maybe didn't expect. Oh, Ollie, was something that I was very late to the party on was the proper treatment of uncertainties. We can all do uncertainties of a burette and a measuring cylinder and oh, the glassware is no problem. But when you're doing logarithmic uncertainties, and what do you do with it when you've got two different logarithmic uncertainties? How do you deal with that? And it wasn't until I researched how to, I did a video on uncertainties. I learnt whilst doing that video, how to actually deal with natural logs and log uncertainties for my own teaching. It looks like I was confident and knew exactly what I was doing. I didn't have a Scooby-Doo before I made that video. And like you say, having to articulate it and knowing it's going to be on the internet and everyone can see it. And there are so many people that want to comment and you make one little error. Trust me, they will tell you like that, you know, you know, within a day, if you've missed a decimal point or if you've got a number incorrect, the, 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 the army of fact checkers that are out there will be on your case quicker than you can say, boo. Yeah, there's, there's something about that accountability of putting something onto the internet, right? That you know it needs to be to a, a, a reasonable standard, otherwise it's going to just get slammed and, and people are very quick to, to identify weaknesses or, or mistakes and it's inevitable well, almost are. that you're going to make something. Yeah, well, of course, we're all human. You know, if you look at uh, Rich Thornley's videos or MSJ Chem or Andrew Wang before he monetized, bless him, they've always got a comment under there now and again, which says, oh, you didn't, you know, you forgot it was 100 cm cubed, not a decimeter cubed, or you didn't do a meters cubed, you know, all that stuff. Now and again, a couple will fall through, but we are human at the end of the day. You know, I don't think any teacher got 100% first class honors degree in their chemistry when they were at university. We have to remember we are human beings. You know, the, the simulations and databases will always be correct. We are not quite at their level yet. Yeah, it's, it's another one I learned through the, the, the textbook writing process. I have a lot more empathy now when I spot an error in a textbook. Yep. There are so many moving parts and with the best will in the world and focus for, for hours and hours, stuff is going to slip through. And I kind of now, whereas before I would have been like, yeah, this is a textbook, you know, it should be perfect. I kind well, of you have, have an appreciation. The, yeah. Yes, you have seen the IB chemistry teacher Facebook page um, when the IB have made the odd error in an exam or there is an error in a textbook. Oh, my gosh, that does go viral in that narrow world of the IB chemistry teacher community. That will just go. ab, And we know all the characters that will just go absolutely slam that. Yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> OK, it's well, the same yeah, on we, YouTube. We, yeah. Uh, yeah, any any domain really, it's it's going to be the same, yeah. isn't it? But <laughs> we've kind of we've talked and danced around the IA a little bit. Let, let's get into some of the the nitty gritty. And, and, and like you said, it's worth prefacing this with, uh, we're kind of straddling the old course and the new course at the moment. I think you probably as an Australian school, maybe have just started the new course. Are you, are you yeah, on a, you start in January? I've literally began teaching this year, this January. So I'm only almost two months into probably four, we've done four, we're at week five, we've done five weeks of teaching of the new syllabus. Yes. Yeah, so the, and the IA, although the, the kind of format and the grading criteria have, have changed, as, as you mentioned, the essence of the IA is is still pretty much the same in, in, in what I can see. Like a, a good IA in the old yeah. course will be considered a good IA in this course. Oh, so let, let's absolutely let, let's maybe start then. What are some of the, the kind of the easy wins and particularly, I suppose, we're focusing on as a, a new or an inexperienced teacher? What kind of things can can we make sure are done well to maximize success? Okay, um, I would probably put at number one, the um, biggest struggle that new teachers will have is they seem to ruminate to great lengths on choosing the research question. And certainly, as you mentioned, there's almost 3000 members in the chemistry teacher Facebook group, I would say the number one thing is, is this research question going to score my kids good marks? Or is this going to be a high scoring IA? And that that question itself shows uh, a naivety in some ways from the from the teacher because as probably many of us know it's not what you do it's the way that you actually do it and i think some of the best advice we can give to kids is is just begin just start it, it confuses me why um many teachers just hesitate and don't say okay do the bottom and the top of your independent variable range 
and see if there's any relationship whatsoever. Because the kids are great. They come with some wonderful ideas, but they are 16, 17, sometimes 18 years old. They've not had the chemistry education that we have. They don't know that when you uh, do an electrolysis, all of the little flakes are going to fall off to the bottom of the uh, beaker. You're not going to work out what's still stuck to it, what's underneath it. You've got flocculation. Uh, you've got temperature. You've got temperature increasing because you're electrolyzing. You've, you've got the concentration changing because you. And there's all these things which they don't perhaps um, see as they go through. So I think the best advice is just begin. Don't worry. Do the bottom of the IV and the top of the IV range. And then the number two is number protocols. Uh, poor number protocols throughout will have you slammed immediately in your method. Have you slammed on your uh, data tables? Have you slammed in your graph? And if you slammed in your data tables and your graph because your sig figs or your decimal places or your calculations are incorrect or classics like limiting reactants, failing to see a limiting reactant problem, failing to control the variables that you were saying you were controlling in the method, this holistic view. If you said you're going to control temperature and I don't see a table that said temperature was this throughout the reaction, you haven't controlled it. That was just a wish. That's not a thing that you've actually done. So your experiments are out of control. Your number protocols are incorrect. If you've not propagated your uncertainties because your number protocols were incorrect in the first place on your graph, that's the uh, analysis marks down. And the hardest one to get, that conclusion evaluation, which was 6 out of 24, and now it's going to be 12 out of 24. This is going to be 50%. You haven't got a hope in hell's chance of scoring anything above the, the lower bands in conclusion evaluation if you don't have that um, lucidity of data treatment to enable you to talk about the magnitude of the systematic and the random errors and link the decent improvements to those systematic and random errors. Um, I think when I speak to schools and, and I do a little bit of training with schools and webinars and things, it's really powerful for them to see that the whole view, the, the view of the whole IA, I suppose this comes in, in communication, does what you set off at the beginning actually get answered at the end? And to what extent was it answered? That whole stand back. And one of the big things I make a point of is just stand back and look. What did the student want to do? What did they end up doing? And to what extent have they actually chemically, does that actually make sense? The chemistry often sinks an IA where the teacher has not spotted that something is flawed or something is just fundamentally incorrect from the basic premise of the internal assessment. In terms of new teachers, the temptation is to say, do an iodine clock, do a BZ reaction, do an oscillating reaction, um, do the iodination of propanone, do any rate of reaction, do an Arrhenius plot, because all of these things can and do score well. But I suppose the, the hesitation is that's not really what the IA is about. The IA should be something that the student has come up with. And yeah, that's the, that's the blue skies thing. And I suppose that's the difficulty because when you want that blue skies thing, and I know some schools have you know over 100 kids they're going to have to have an individual IA for all the students. I don't know how on earth they do that. That is just mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. um, they could do it with the databases and simulations with the wet chemistry lab based stuff. I wouldn't know where to begin. You know, well, I wouldn't know where to begin. Half of them would be doing iodine clock, could be their reactions, um, inhibition of oxidation of vitamin C in whichever fruits or vegetable you, you decide. And then we'd have a hundred different IAs. So I think if it was brand new, I would play it safe because uh, moderators are quite a conservative bunch. Uh, if you are playing it safe, and let's say you're doing inhibition of oxidation of vitamin C, so many IAs are oxidation of vitamin C, just inhibit the <laughs> oxidation with the reducing sugar, just stick a reducing sugar in, right? And see what, how, to what extent does that inhibit the oxidation? Give it a new twist. You've already said to the, to the moderator, I care about what I'm doing. I'm trying to do something different. I've just not got another carton of orange juice from the school canteen some iodine, thiosulfate, and titrated it, okay? The danger in doing that, there's nothing wrong with doing that, and I do get lambasted about this in the Chemistry Teacher <laughs> Facebook group. There's nothing totally wrong with doing that. Um, you can score pretty well doing that, and every year students do score pretty well doing that if they do the number treatment and the propagation of errors and the graphs and the conclusion evaluation well. There's no reason. But the moderator knows that IA like no other IA. They know that so well. They know every little flaw that you could possibly make in that experiment. So have you validated that you're being specific to vitamin C? Well, are there any other acids in there? It's for orange juice, I'm sure as hell there are. Have you talked about any of the other fruit acids? Have you talked about anything else that could potentially interfere with the result? Because if you haven't, 
guaranteed that moderator knows you should be doing that and you're going to be marked down. If you put the reducing sugar in there and inhibit the oxidation, it's like, ah, this is an interesting approach. It's actually slowed it down and like there's more vitamin C at the end that would have been with the control. Beautiful. You've surprised them a little bit. Okay. And I think for, as a moderator, I'd say half of the IAs that we get, I might get shot for this, will be uh, temperature on galvanic cell, vitamin yeah. C, temperature on rate of reaction, whatever reaction that happens to be, iodine clock, um, and I don't know, maybe uh, pH, pKa, half equivalence point. That's probably over half the IAs every year, hands down. You know? Yeah. And... As a moderator, I get assigned, I think it's 110. Normally that comes down because uh, some pass quick, some take longer. It, it values between 90 and 110 IAs. Every moderator gets to do within the space of about six weeks. So you're running about four or five a day. I would argue it takes one hour to mark properly one internal assessment. Mm. So it's a big ask. And we are humans. If it gets to 11 o'clock at night and we are doing these at 11 o'clock at night, I guess we've done three before and you get into the last one for the day. And it's vitamin C. It's like, okay, we're going to mark this fairly. We're going to be generous. We're going to be kind. But if there's myth, they've missed something, I know exactly where it is. Just boom, 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 down, 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 done. Okay. If it's something new and fresh, it's like, ah, oh, that wakes you up a bit. It's like, oh, this is interesting. This kid, this, this school, it cares enough about the assessment procedure to actually look at um, the effects of substituents on the dihedral angle of asymmetric alkanes. That's like, wow, that got me going, you know? And um, certainly in the IB chemistry teacher group, I do get a little bit of flack for saying things of that nature. It's not a PhD, Mr. Midgley. Uh, these are 16, 17 year old students and they are, and I get that, you know. And, um, you know, I would keep those sort of higher level research questions for my higher level kids that want to be Oxford, Cambridge, Stanford, MIT, those kids that want to go there because it gives them something fantastic and fresh to talk about in the interview and also more likely to get a higher score and go towards those high 40s that they need. If a student wants to go to Hull University, my university, or they want to go to, I don't know, uh, Australia or wherever, and they only need 38 points, fine. Do your iodine clock, do your BZ reaction, do one over T for your period of oscillation of your BZ reaction. It's a fun thing to watch. It gives you beautiful data. And it's a bit interesting. You put the pictures into it and it's a nice IA. It's a nice IA. That's a, a level six if done well IA in anybody's book, maybe mm. a level seven with the right color socks on. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And a, a point that you, you mentioned there that I, I hadn't really considered before, particularly I remember when I was starting, I was a similar situation to you. I was the only IB chemistry teacher. I was yep. kind of totally new really to teaching. So it kind of lent towards those simple IAs in terms of your rate to riding clocks. Which, which is great, but as you pointed out, if the moderators are seeing 30 of those a week, actually they're pretty good at spotting the errors. So if you do choose to do these simple little kind of, yeah, maybe simple is not quite the right word, but those sure. kind of standard IAs, you need yep. to be really careful, particularly in your draft feedback, just making sure, hey, are they doing things properly? You mentioned like number conventions really throughout the whole thing. Is there a consistently yeah. correct approach to, to what they're doing? Because those mistakes are going to get picked up a lot, a lot more quickly by moderators compared to some new, slightly more innovative IA. Oh, on the on the marking module, there are uh, pre-assigned uh, comments that you can make to speed up the marking process. Right. And one of them is, I think it's something like poor number protocols. It basically means that it's something like that. You just drag and drop poor number, poor number, poor number. You don't have to think about it. Like you, you've got two sig fig in your, your data and you've got four sig fig in your answer. Immediately that's a markdown sort of thing. Right. If it's done throughout the IA. But the IB are damned if they do and damned if they don't because the IB did the teacher support material, did the TSM. And on that TSM was one IA, which was about uh, the effect of substituent on bond angle and different like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, whatever, and why it wasn't 109.5 degrees in an SP3 hybridized molecule. And that the, the, that was given, I think it was given about 21 or 22 out of 24 in the legacy syllabus on the teacher support material. And we see that one all of the time as well. But yeah. I didn't agree with that 21, 22 out of 24, to be honest. If that was um, marked under the IB criteria, that was worth about 12 or a 13. The number of protocols were awful. The data was limited. The conclusion was superficial. I, I, uh, so, yeah, um, the fact that they provide examples 
and give high grades to them sold a lot of students and schools down the river, I, I feel. And that was another motivation for, for making the, the videos. Um, you know, with, with COVID coming along and, and t teachers not able to go in the laboratory, I felt it was uh, my duty as someone that had an inside information without giving too much away to show students how they could actually get a high scoring IA. Because while the hoops are there and it will say that you have appropriate treatment of errors, it doesn't say that standard deviation is not acceptable for less than 10 data points. Uh, it doesn't tell you that, um, no, you don't have to use uh, maximum minimum gradients, but if you do, it certainly helps you to just get the higher scores more easily because you've done a proper treatment of errors. So all that unpacking stuff, that's where the, the videos came from. Uh, sorry if that just went off your question there. Uh, no, 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 yeah. it's true. And it, 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 it's worth me pointing out people should check out your videos. Maybe I'll link a, a couple of, uh, of, <laughs> of really good ones in the in the show notes here, because I think there's something, you know, there's like an hour or a bit over an hour. I think one of them you're going through as a as a moderator and, and you get a real sense of what you're seeing that maybe certainly less experienced teachers will gloss over or, or, or not not recognize. Yep. And I think it, it's really helpful just to see a couple of those examples to give you a sense of what you're looking for and, and how you're looking um, at sure. different parts of, of an eye, which is, which is, which is super helpful. I think you're just going back to one point you mentioned the kind of comparing the start and the finish of the report, often students, yeah. by the time they get to the conclusion evaluation, they've kind of wandered away from their research question. One really simple thing that I realized a few years ago would help that is just restate the, the research question at the beginning of the conclusion. So students are like, oh, right, okay, Perfect. that's what I was trying Perfect. to answer. Can I now address that question? Because I would find students off in the woods, totally miles away from the original destination that they had planned to, yeah, to, to go it, to. It, it, and we do, we do appreciate fully, it is, it is their baby. They've spent at least 10 hours, probably many students spend many more hours than the 10 on this report that they have it's probably the biggest one of the biggest scientific reports they've ever done in their lives and we totally get that um but that that teacher voice at the end of it just to sanity check what they've done um probably because people are new and don't quite yet understand what's what's going on with the ia and like i said it's a steep learning curve that could be that could be helped i think a lot by the information perhaps that the IB give out. And so some, hopefully some of that, so uh, I'm not trying to sell my channel here. There's other channels that also do this, but you know, <laughs> that just that, that spending that time, that that's the theme of all of us, right? We all had to spend some time. There was something on the syllabus we didn't quite get, you know, mm. and I'm certainly of an age now where, oh, I'm teaching Henderson Hasselback next week. I best have a look at that before I go in. I've not done that for a year. So I've forgotten how to, and, and that, that, constant desire to actually want to learn that's how you show the and i'm sure everybody does that's how you show the respect to the kids that you're teaching yeah definitely yeah i wonder just again with your experience as an ia moderator and having taught for a long time how do you actually approach the ia in class you know how long are you provide when do you start the ia how long are you giving students to think about it before you actually carry out the practical work is are there any like basic structures you use in in the, the actual ia process it's an interesting point. I know that uh, many schools that I've spoken to, they um, wait until the second year and then the students do one IA. I, I know they've taught them uncertainties and they've taught them about the rubric and things, but they don't do any internal assessment and they do one and that's their one. That's what they, that's what they submit. And I don't know what you did in your teaching, Ollie, maybe you had that, that model, but certainly I've always done partial IAs from almost day one. Um, right. The students in year 11, Students in year 11, within the first couple of weeks, will do empirical formula, magnesium oxide, and we'll be talking about uncertainties in there and creating data tables and making sure they can use sheets and making sure they can plot a graph. So all those skills that they'll use eventually in the IA are developed throughout the course. And they will do two, depending on the spread, at least two practice IAs before they do the final IA in the uh, middle of the second year. We have a date, we have one day off timetable to do the IA. Right. I'm actually going to answer your question. I have an IA authorization sheet, which I start in the January, which we decide whether their research question is a viable, because like I said before, the kids have these wonderful ideas, but we don't have these exotic chemicals that they found from um, some AI bot about how to work out, I don't know, the copper two plus in oranges, whatever it happens to be, right? And yeah. we, we don't have, the, so that sanity check from me at the beginning to make sure that the research question is viable. 
Do we have the materials? And is it likely to give a range? I wouldn't say to the kid, if it's something standard, that's not going to work because the temperature's not in a big enough range. I think it's lovely for them to find that out and then reflect on it in their internal assessment. And the IB's big on reflection and for a very good point, that's very powerful. And they can talk about that. And that, that's their personal engagement exploration, tick, 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 tick. I did a trial. It didn't work. I expanded the range or the range was too big and it, the, the, I didn't need to have that. And I, or I could have used less chemicals. To do. All this reaction, all this reflection, this is uh, this is um, exploration of, of the highest order and reflection, which is in there. So even if it, I don't believe it will work, and sometimes it doesn't, I'm I'm wrong. They go ahead and they do it and then come back and they say, oh, okay, and they tweak it. So that will be February, March, and now we'll go in term two. So April, they will have a full day of timetable to do their data collection. Um, I've mentioned the secondary data stuff. So they know how to do uncertainties, certainly by halfway through, at the latest three quarters of the way through year 11, uh, DP year one. Uncertainties, graphing skills, uh, sheets, formulae, that's explicitly taught by me. That's something, I don't know if it's just our school, that they don't, the kids don't seem to have a big clue about how to do. And just even getting an R squared value and doing maximum gradients and uncertainties and propagating the uncertainties, I guess they don't have to do that in other subjects. Uh, that's something yeah. I have to teach explicitly, you know. So I will set up an experiment whenever I fancy. I mean, it could be equilibrium, it could be kinetics, it could be redox, doesn't matter what the experiment is. And then we'll set up a sheet and then we'll put the formula in and then we'll do the graph and the uncertainties and the error bars and all those things as part of a standard practical. So I'm not expecting them to do the whole conclusion evaluation, personal engagement or investigation, whatever it is now. It's just purely that data because, like I said, if the, the number protocols, if we get that correct and the data processing correct, that's half of the IA done, sorted. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the, the kids get a full day off. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. The kids get a full yeah. day off. They then submit. They get their draft in at the end of the term. I mark it over the next holiday and then they get it back for the last uh, corrections. And, and as you know, I just write on there, look at this, change this. I don't tell them what to do. I tell them what needs really looking at. As that's the yeah. uh, IB guidance on that one. So all the way through, and I also enmesh in the teaching, as I mentioned, all the Webmo, Chem Computes, Chem Reacts, Chem Collective, all the way through. So the kids are seeing example research questions as, as they go through. And certainly on the Chem Reacts, there's, I think there's 130 different um, simulations that they can run at anywhere from, I think it's zero Kelvin up to 5,000 Kelvin. Um, <laughs> so, it, and the pressure you can change from no atmospheres up to a, a thousand atmospheres, there's the, the variety of uh, range you can put into there is just mind boggling. And when they see that, even just on Chem Reacts and Chem Collective, there's, there's a thousand research questions just waiting for you. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And I, I, I didn't realize that the kind of database slash simulation resources are so much better than I thought, you know, the, the limiting yep. factor for me pushing students towards those ideas was, well, they're, they're pretty limited. Some of the simulations is not, not an awful lot you can change around, but I'm encouraged to hear you say there are places which actually, yeah, well, you many can do are. it. Many are, Ollie. I mean, I'll mention FET Colorado, which is fantastic for teaching, wonderful yeah. simulations, no good for IA, you know, yeah. you, Every time you run it, you get the same result. If that's what happens, that's what's happening with your simulation. That's no good for internal assessment. We want range in the data. We want uncertainty. Without that, we're not we're not doing an internal assessment. We're just teaching. Yeah. I don't know equilibria. But the the Chem Collective one, I I run that with the kids. Uh, we were doing um, temperature on KSP. That's a nice one because KSP is not on the IB syllabus, but it's a a little yeah. thing. A nice easy uh, products over reactant squared over the original one plot the graph and you can alter the temperature zero to hundred degrees C there's like seven or eight different salts and uh, you can change the concentrations. You can change the temperatures, change the salts, effective size of cation. If you want to go that down that road all within the simulation, but every, every kid could be doing the same salt and the same measurement, but they get a different, slightly different result in the second or third decimal place. And that's what we're looking for. It's unique results. So if it's just programmed to give you the same result each time, no good. But if you run it twice, get two different results, then you're on to a winner. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a helpful kind of a uh, benchmark for, for a decent simulation. I'll, I'll, I'll rewatch this conversation and write down some of these resources because actually it already in my head, I'm thinking, Hey, actually more kids could be doing these kind of simulation based things, which takes some pressure off. If you've got a large cohort of kids, you're teaching whatever, 20, 30 kids, actually that's a lot of practical work going on and it's, it's 
yeah, stressful and difficult to manage. So actually knowing that these simulations oh, are available is... There are many simulation sites, uh, videos on YouTube. Have a look at mine, which is best simulations and best databases for IB chemistry. There's 10 simulations, 10 databases that are in there, which were made in response to the pandemic because we're going to get into the laboratory. That's why I found out about all this. That was another self-directed learning curve that I got into on, on that one. But, but I'd say probably around half of my kids every year now do a secondary database. Uh, last year it was really. A bit more. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting and encouraging to to know, and I think hopefully will relieve a bit of stress for for people who are in you know, difficult schools, maybe kind of less well resourced or large cohorts. I think that's that's a really I would advocate nice going thing to, to know. Yeah. So sorry, Ollie, thanks. Uh, I would advocate going to Chemreax, C H E M R E A X, and there are tutorials and there are model experiments that you can use. Show to your kids. It just guides you through step by step what to do. And they can tweak that, they can change that and make it their own. I had one student do that two years ago. I think it was the effect of uh, concentration on the order of the reaction, which you could never hope to do yeah. on the lab bench. This is purely mathematical. That IA is still on in thinking as a perfect example of how to get 24 out of 24 on a database IA, which is, is there, it's in public, it's, and, and the, the student that wrote it is very happy for it to be there. But have a look yeah. at that. It's a beautiful, beautiful work of... Uh, an elegant work of internal assessment. Yes. Lovely. Artistic. It really is. Um, it really is. Yes. <laughs> superb, James. I'm conscious that you uh, you have dinner coming up. Probably uh, it's being warmed up as, as we speak. So, uh, Sorry, I'll a talker. Got... Yes. <laughs> no, it's, it's great. And I uh, you know, hope to get you back on at some point. I know you also spent a lot of time playing around with AI and some of the new tools yep. and apps um, that exist and have come into existence in the last few years. So I'd love to get you back on and, and pick your brains about those at another time, but perhaps we can wrap up with a, a few little quick fire questions um, before, before signing off the, the first one of those, what's your least favorite topic area to teach? Um, I reflected on this long and hard all week since you sent the questions through last weekend, Ollie, thank you for that. I decided on organic which is surprising because it's actually my favorite at the same time. So it's kind of a, a duplicitous response. Maybe it's my TOK teaching, which led me here as well. I find it so frustrating that we teach them uh, benzene, nitration of benzene, reduction of the nitro to the amine, and then we stop. It's like giving the introduction to the Lord of the Rings and not going and getting the ring. It really is. It's just... What about diazotization? Like, like the pathways after that are just absolutely phenomenal. This has created purple, which if we didn't have purple dye, I mean, Perkins or not, we'd all be wearing sackcloth. This is like one of the most massive <laughs> contributions to humanity ever. And yet we stop at phenylamine. So my answer is organic because of frustration, not because of content. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, second question, <laughs> what, what's your most memorable um, demo or practical failure or, or one of the most? <laughs> um, I have a number. Um, uh, I think I've been teaching so long that I, I have a choice. I'll let you choose. Do you fancy the runaway thermite, the birds in the flu? <laughs> Um, in fact, leave it at those two. Do you want the, the runaway thermite or the birds in the flu? Let's leave it there. Uh, God, I'm intrigued one? by the second, but I love the idea of thermite getting away from you. So let's go thermite. When I was in Japan, I got fascinated by thermite. It was such a, an alarming beastie to set off on the bench. And you get the magnesium fuse because I was old school. I wasn't even permanganating glycerol at the time, which I do now. Manganese fuse, boom. And thought, well, this is iron uh, salts. What about if you use copper? It will surely go green. It'll be even more fantastic. So yes, of course, it went green. We put the copper in that. We've got the cop molten copper coming down. That was beautiful. And then I started making more exotic mixtures, more exotic metal salts that I found on the... And I put it over, and I think I had one heatproof mat at the bottom, the tripod. Right. Um, I had the crucible and the, the uh, large beaker with the sand and the water. And this thing went off. And I had the screens up, right? This thing went off. Oh, my God. It just went absolutely nuts. And the thing went straight through, like down through the sand. The glass beaker smashed, broke, fractured, and it went through the bench. Now, I was on the third floor in a tall building. It's Japan. It's quite high, right? Yeah. And underneath my laboratory was the staff room. And I worked out underneath where that molten metal was about to leak through the ceiling 
was an old chair where one of the old physics teachers sat and I was just sat there thinking, <laughs> oh my God, this has gone, this has gone very, very wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's sincerely. Heart was going, heart was going on that one. Yes. It's a, it's a quick end to your IB chemistry career if that goes uh, any worse, isn't it? We would not be sat here now, Ollie. Yes. Or you'd be behind bars. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, uh, the, the birds in the flu quickly. We've got, ten, we've got 10 minutes. Go on. The birds in the flu, I was in Penang, and I was doing the uh, coins in nitric acid, NO2, right? And uh, I didn't have a laboratory with a fume cupboard, so I borrowed the brand new biology teacher's uh, fume cupboard in the new laboratory. Put the nitric acid in, put a couple of coins in, voluminous NO2, brilliant, wonderful, sir, fantastic teacher. Yep, thank you very much. Off we go. About a week later, the biology teacher says, James, what did you do in the fume cupboard? Ah, oh, some copper, nitric acid, I don't know, too. He said, it really, really smells bad. And a few days later, he said, it's got worse. It's got much worse. So I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize if no 2 has corroded something. I don't know. Anyway, the maintenance guys went and had a look in the flu. And because she's a biologist, she didn't really use the fume cupboard. And in the time of its non-use, some birds had made a nest oh, in the no. flu. <laughs> yes. And I assume... That yes, the NO2 was the demise of that uh, small family of uh, birds oh, in the, the tropics yeah. of Penang. Yeah, NO2, not, not <laughs> traditionally good for, for living organisms, I don't think. Apparently, yes, yes. So th those were the two that came to mind, Ollie. I hope no one's too traumatised by those stories. No, yeah, we'll put a, a trigger warning at the beginning of the episode about uh, the harm to, <laughs> to animals. Yeah, those are, those are two impressive ones. Uh, okay, question three. Um, who have you learned the most from in the context of becoming a better teacher? Um, I mean, the good, the best answer is we learn from everybody that we meet, you know, um, every teacher I've ever worked with has taught me something. I, I did, I, I walked in on a HSC, uh, high school certificate, the Australian curriculum lesson by a maths teacher just the other day, who's not a trained chemistry, she's a mathematician, but she was, asked to teach chemistry at HSE, so she was very similar to IB. And she was teaching uh, KA, PKA, P, PB, K, PKB calculations. But she was teaching it as a maths teacher. So she wrote out the problem, and then she drew the logic on the right-hand side. And this is, I do this because, I do this because, I do this. And all right, I don't do that. I just say, you know, obviously, this is an equilibrium. That's why that's a big concentration. So that's ruled out, and that's why we square it, and boom, and that's obvious, right? But no, she went, no, that's not obvious. This is what the thought process is. So I learned mm. that from, from her the other day. Um, the big ones for me, John Chewy and yeah. his um, hydrogen bond strength. If you've seen that, that's on his uh, site. And you go onto WebMo and you alter the uh, bond length in a hydrogen molecule until it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then event it breaks, so you get the Moore's curve of the yeah. optimum bond distance. You can do it for pH2 or F2 or Cl2, I2. You can change it. Here's an IA that's, that's in the making here. That was just absolutely phenomenal. And when you do that with a class at the beginning of year 11 and you assign them each a bond length and then they actually get the curve all together as a class and they collaborate and they learn, that for me, that's like the pinnacle of, of IB teaching, what IB teaching is about. And, and John Chewy introduced me to WebMo, WebMo, which I use all the time in organic chemistry. Our kids use it all the time for their internal assessments with chem compute, but that's probably another episode in, entirely to, to getting the two to, to speak together. And that led me on to finding out myself about Chem Collective and Chem Reacts and University of Missouri and all these other ones. So, so he was a catalyst, really. I've used, borrowed, stolen many of the things he showed me and other mm. people. And then that, that I've built on that with the stuff that, that I've done. And that's where a lot of my videos, the, the videos came from. So I'd highlight John Chewy. Richard Thornley is a legend. Um, I've collaborated of with course. him on a, on a video or two. Uh, we message each other quite frequently. We're now, I'd say, good mates, Richard Thornley and I. And, and Jeff News, as I said earlier, he is like the Pope of, of IB chemistry. Sorry if that offends anybody, but he is the uh, whatever he, religious persuasion he is. He is the godfather. And for him to message me and ask, can I put this video on my, my website? It's just like, whoa, that, that, was, that was the higher echelons of achievement in IB chemistry. Yes. Yeah, great. So, yeah, John Chewy. Uh, last question then, if you were to recommend one kind of external resource to a new teacher, and that might be any of the big websites or something more nuanced, what what, what do you think that would be? Um, for complete uh, course coverage, um, I would go with uh, InThinking, definitely. Um, hmm. 
Jeff is Jeff is awesome. He does a lot of the higher level thinking stuff, and it's, it's a lot of it's kind of like pushing the sevens. The the, the, the questions are very high level. To complement that, if I have, I'm, I'm going to cheat with the question here, um, I'm also using Cognity, and I would say that that has um, increased its effectiveness massively over the last year or so. And the new syllabus stuff is is a wonderful uh, resource for for all teachers to have. I'm not sponsored by either of those uh, two. <laughs> yeah. Sweets, but I say I use those. I use in thinking and cognitive in my teaching on a on a weekly basis. Yeah, beautiful. Right, James, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on this this kind of experimental first episode, and I also appreciate appreciate in a in a bigger sense your your efforts to kind of support teachers, um, it, particularly in the IA, has been helpful for me. But in a broader sense, with your YouTube channel and the the kind of answering questions and stuff on the Facebook group, so. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure. real pleasure to talk to you. I've, I've, I've learned a lot already in just 55 minutes, which is, which is brilliant. And hopefully at some point in the future, I'll be able to get you back on, maybe uh, break down artificial intelligence um, at, at another point. It's a brave new world. Thanks very much for having me, Ollie. Very much appreciated. Thank you. And thanks for watching. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy your dinner, mate. Cheers, buddy. Take care. Cheers. Thanks.